this is lecture eight on the course of apologetics before we start let's have a word of prayer father god lord of the universe let us find ways to understand you let us find a way to look at you to dig in deep and trying to find words that can express who you are what you are what you were doing we ask you we beg you Lord glorify your name in us and through us specifically through this course of apologetics this we pray in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen in lecture 7 we explained what it is to have the noetic structure remember the nous the mind and then the next thing we did was we looked at the presuppositionals the ideas before you start and when what you think is being based on what you experience and you know and you thought before so that is you can almost say that is presuppositional the third part of it is to look at the role of the Holy Spirit and again we have to look at the, the Bible let me say that of course because that is what we are thinking of that is what we are aiming for to understand to understand what the Bible is actually giving us and to to do so we have to go to the book of John that the Gospel of John chapter 3 and we read the verses 5 and 6 Jesus is speaking Jesus answered verse 5 very truly or truly truly or you can say amen amen I tell you no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit give birth to the spirit you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again the wind blows wherever it pleases you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going so is it with everyone born of the spirit so to explain this is that Jesus himself is saying to us look at the the materials that are available the materials are available in the book of John in chapter 3 to verses from the verses 5 on and I read until verse 8 just to give you an idea it says no one can enter the kingdom unless that means that there is a um, you can almost say there's a presupposition here unless unless they are born of water and the spirit and yes we can talk about being born of water some people say that is the birth the, the physical birth others say that is the baptism 
Uh, others have even a different meaning. It's a totally different thing, but we are not going into that because we are gearing our attention to the next part, and that is born of the Spirit. You have to be spiritually born. That is another way of saying you have to be born again. Jesus is talking about this issue in that same chapter. You have to be born again. Now, here he says, you have to be born from the Spirit. The Spirit has to be born in you. When, when you become a Christian, you are doing something in response to what God is doing in you. The Holy Spirit enlightens every person. You can see that in the first chapter of John. So everyone has the possibility of answering to God. When you answer to God, God is answering too. So that is conversion. And then the Spirit comes near to you, in you. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit lives in me, lives in you. That is, of course, if you are born again. If you have, first of all, uh, expressed your, uh, your sinfulness to God, accept the offer Jesus brought on the cross, and bringing to you today, if you never accepted him as Lord and Savior, you can do that right now. And, and Jesus is going to answer, and the Holy Spirit is going to come over you. That is the idea here. You should not be surprised what I'm saying. That is what Jesus is saying. Okay. You must be born again. Literally, it says, you must be born from on high. God bringing the Spirit in you. So, on one hand, you are lifting your life up to a higher level. And then God is, is confirming this, this new thing in your life with a new birth. Spiritually, you become a born again a born from on high person. So the rebirth is explained here. And then Jesus goes on saying, you know, the wind, pneuma, that's the, the Greek word, the wind, that's the same word for spirit. So the spirit blows wherever it pleases. Of course, when you say the Spirit blows, it sounds a bit strange. So the, the, the translation it probably it goes about, or it speaks about uh, the wind. So let's use the wind. Okay, the wind blows wherever it pleases. The Spirit does whatever it pleases. You cannot force the Spirit. No, the Spirit is available to you. And when you do certain things, or certain things, God is going to answer. You hear the sound of the wind, and in the same way you can say, spiritually spoken, you hear the sound of the Spirit, and the Spirit is coming to you, and then He settles in you, in your life. In we usually say it settles in our heart. Of course, not the, the muscle that is pumping blood, but it's the center of who we are and what we are. That's where the Spirit comes in. You cannot tell. You, you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. No, you can't, because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of God. You know, when uh, when you look at the wind, uh, we know with the, the, the different pressures in, in, in the area, 
when you have a high pressure and you have a low pressure when they meet wind comes in you can say that's the the the, the source of the wind no it's not because the, the the wind is already there and then when those two come together they they, they form against against each other uh, a blowing and again the wind is is going up and down okay and and then it blows from east to west and from north to south and and from up to you know and and that is how you have to look at the spirit you do not know the spirit as such because the spirit is the spirit of god that's not our spirit we also have a spirit and that is linking up with the holy spirit and that's the the idea behind it what is important is that so it is with everyone not just the pastor not just the preacher not just the elder or the deacon or uh, the, the missionary or the teacher no the spirit is with everybody every one born of the spirit so when you are born of the spirit you have a direct link an inside link with God himself so that is what what we see here when you look at it so that is what we have as explanation here and um, this is something it, it's almost too difficult to explain to to people who are not born again it's too difficult to explain because we are talking about spiritual matters and you know what what, what is the reality of uh, people like I said everyone is being influenced by the spirit it's like a child that is not yet born that's in the mother's womb you know when when you want to have a quiet child uh, listen, uh, the, the, the mother has to listen to quiet music and then the child inside the mother's womb will uh, will accept the soft music as normal and will react to it in a soft way that is how people who are not yet born also hear about the spirit you hear him but it's 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 not I mean, it's not clear words because you have not learned the value of words you, you know sounds you you hear sounds you, you can actually say you feel sounds and at the same time that is um, you know it, it's not completely clear because you do not understand you cannot understand because you're not born yet and the same goes in spiritual matters that if you're not born again you cannot understand the spirit and um, we can talk talk about that for a long time but which we are not going to do we're just looking at what the spirit is doing so that is what the spirit is doing according directly according to Jesus in <coughs> excuse me in 1st Corinthians 2 the verses 10 to 13 we have Paul is reacting to that let me read the text first these are the things God has revealed us by his spirit the spirit searches all things even the deep things of God for who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them in the same way in the same way no one knows the thought of God except the Spirit of God what we have received is not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given to us 
This is what we speak, not in words taught or ta taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. There's a lot. I mean, you can, you can, you can have a whole sermon on, on this text. What is the Spirit doing? The Spirit is searching God's intents. And He is bringing those intents, that is if you're born again and the Spirit lives in you, He brings that intent to you. One of the specific intent we have is what we call the Bible. The Word of God. God revealed this to you and to me. So the Spirit reveals that in the same way no one knows the thought of God except the Spirit of God. You and I do not know the thoughts of God except the Spirit reveals it to you. When the Spirit lives in you, He wants you to know. How do you know? Well, you have to read your Bible. That's why we say we have to read your Bible every day. You have to think about the Bible every day. You have to think about God every day. You have to think about what is happening in the Bible, what is happening to me today. And so we have to bring those two together. My life, led by the Spirit, the Spirit Himself, knowing the thoughts, the deep thoughts of God, bringing me into contact with Him. He wrote down the Word of God, and so I have to read that Word to understand. And then another thing, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. He has freely given you and me. He has freely given. Freely. I mean, um, there's no payment due anymore. I don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. The Spirit is giving it because God is giving it through Him to you. Because of what? Because of what the Lord Jesus did at the cross. He set you free so that you can be free to accept the Spirit into your life. And from that moment on, you're Spirit-filled. That is, if you let the Spirit rule you, if you let the Spirit go into you and use you in a, in a let me say it, mighty way. The other thing we see here is that this is what we speak. What do we speak? Well, we speak words that are spiritual. When we talk about certain things in the Bible or certain things in, in spirituality, let me give you an example. When you speak about grace, what do you mean by grace? Because when people hear grace, they say, well, I know a girl with the name Grace. Or they will say, Oh, you mean you're a convicted felon and the governor or the president or the king in your country gives you grace and say you don't have to go to prison. That's grace. But what is grace in the biblical sense, in the spiritual sense? Grace is the God given ability to do things. We are saved by grace. We are not saved by works, not what I'm doing, although that is important, but that's not the first thing. The first thing is grace. I cannot, I cannot build salvation for myself by doing good things. Roman Catholics think he can do that. Uh, Mormons think you can do that. Islam thinks you can do that. But the Bible says it's different. 
go to Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 and you see it's there and it's not the only text because right before that is the same thing saying again the same thing you're saved by grace you, this, the, you can almost say there's nothing you can do just accept the grace of God the salvation of God the the spirit filling by the Lord God himself and that is what it is meant here and then you speak the same words you say the same word for example grace but you have a different meaning you have a level that is higher than the level the people understand and they cannot understand according to 1st Corinthians 1 they, this this they cannot understand because they do not have the spirit don't blame them because they are innocently let me say it this way they are innocently stupid because they there is a way out a way to accept the Lord Jesus Christ but they don't do that so the spiritual world has certain ways of doing things so it, it's, you can almost say it has a, a different language but it's more like a jargon words that are filled with certain meanings according not to human standards but according to the bible itself so the language is is is, uh, is carried by the spirit and then the spirit comes into you and uses that language so you have to learn how to deal with that so that is uh, 1 Corinthians 2 now we're going to uh, 1 Corinthians 12 the verses 2 to 3 1 Corinthians 12 verse 2 and 3 you know that when you were pagans somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols therefore i want you to know that no one who is speaking by the spirit of god says jesus be cursed and no one can say jesus is lord except by the holy spirit okay <laughs> I've been preaching about this text and I've been talking about this text and I've been teaching about this text but let this be clear it is not because you can say the words Jesus is Lord that you are filled with the Spirit or the Spirit is filling you no that's not what it means nobody can curse Jesus by the Spirit and if you can if you cannot curse him you cannot make him Lord so it's 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 the balance that is important here it's not saying those the specific words it has to do with the reality you, you're not only saying it because your words are carrying your message and your message should be Jesus is Lord but when you say Jesus is Lord you cannot say it at the same time or 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 the, the sentence before or the phrase behind it saying okay god jesus is cursed you, you cannot do it because that is not who you are you are a born again person doing things saying things according to the bible because we are now not anymore influenced by the spirit of mute idols that led us astray but now we are let influenced by the spirit of god a totally different let me say an absolutely different situation so that is just to say that we as believers are different so the role of the holy spirit is guiding us is leading us is helping us is bringing us through on one hand that is the revelation of the bible itself on the other hand it is the revelation of god in nature in the universe and then the third part is what can i do with it so the spirit is 
individually working in me, individual working in you as a person, as a person is helping you. Remember I talked about the day that I was trying to find a Bible for us? That's the Spirit helping. Whoops, and I had the Bible for us. I opened my Bible and there it was. Those are the spiritual stories. Those are the spiritual uh, testimonies. And so we are witnessing what the Spirit is doing. As the people in the New Testament were witnessing what Jesus had done, and they said, you know, this is what is happening. This is what Paul is revealing through the Holy Spirit to us. So he wrote down or he dictated the, the materials we need, we need it and we need and we shall need uh, in, in the future. That is how God works. And that is how the Spirit is influencing us. It's not letting us astray, but it's letting us to God, letting us to Jesus. The Spirit is always glorifying Jesus. If you have a thought that is not glorifying Jesus, that thought is not of the Holy Spirit. That is what you have to understand here. We looked at, or we are still looking at, the worldview issues. Remember, there are a whole range of issues we talked about. We talked about the noetic structure. We talked about, or we asked ourselves the question, what is a presupposition? Uh, then we looked at the role of the Holy Spirit. And now we have uh, the idea of epistemology. Epistemology is a difficult word it's it's, it's derived from the greek uh, and it actually means knowledge so the epistemology we are talking about is um is the greek idea is the because well i must correct myself a bit here it's the biblical idea because we are not talking about knowledge as the world but we are talking about knowledge as being used in the Greek New Testament so it is uh, it, it, it has the meaning of speech it has the meaning of, of word so it's episto episteme and logi it is logical remember the logos jesus is the logos it means word it means explanation it means it means teaching so we we have what we call a christian epistemology or a christian theory of knowledge and it's it's not the e the most easiest thing to explain so uh, let me read a quote it says, uh, the Christian theory of knowledge. If human knowledge is corrupted as a consequence of our innate depravity, let's say sin, and a tendency to invert the creator-creature relationship that is going, uh, being a being a creature and then looking at the cre creator and saying, well, okay, I can do it myself. That, that is a possibility there. And if our wills twist, twist what we know to suit our own ends to a fashion of the world, so we can, we can change uh, the whole thing and, and saying, this is, this is what we would like to hear. This is what we would like to see. And you see that in, in many churches. They preach what the people will hear, would like to hear. It's like the itching ears Paul is talking about. And people like, oh yeah, 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 I would like to be rich. Yes, I would like to have money. Oh, I'd like to have a bigger car. Oh, I'd like to have a bigger house. Oh, I'd like to have, oh no, 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 not the bigger wife. Um, but, you know, you see, that's the itching ears. People like to hear something and, and, and uh, knowledge can bring that to you. 
from a wrong point of view from a wrong, wrong standpoint and so that is what is exalting our own desire to be as God you know certain prosperity gospel pages they will actually say that I am going to be like God absolutely not they are not going to be like God there's no way that is heresy don't believe them it's not true with all the ethical consequences associated with the lust of the flesh then how are we to proceed what do we have to do when we know those things you know that's why I'm teaching so you know those things are wrong W R O N G wrong how is it possible for humans to know anything how is that possible humans can only be uh, can only properly know anything to be to the extent that the factors which hinder or corrupt their knowledge are reversed when you have a certain idea about God and you think you're going to be like God eventually God is going to uh, take his hand off you and say no I don't want to work with them anymore it's like what the Bible is calling the hardening of the heart those people those preachers who preach that they will be like God God has taken his hand of them they are not spiritually they are just good salesmen and you know good salesmen are good sellers and good sellers mean money they have the big cars and the parishioners they don't because they pay humanly or sorry humanity must recognize that God the creator has given all things their meaning God gives meaning to things not we humanity will thus desist from its effort to creatively construct its own world or worlds again something you hear for example in Mormon theology you can become like God and then you can create new heavens and new earth and the universe is so wide there's always place for someone for someone more for uh, or one more God so you can creatively construct your own world of meaning and instead of seeking to understand the things on the basis of the meaning given by the Creator so God is is actually limiting this whole thing so knowledge is good and at the same time it's dangerous let's look at something we talked about already uh, well in a small way we looked at Christian theism um, says that there are two levels of thought the the absolute and the derivative so absolute is what God is saying when I when when things are derived from the absolute that's me that's I that's 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 human Christian theism says that there are two levels of in interpreters God to interpret absolutely and man who must be the reinterpreter of God's interpretation God interprets his ideas into words human words and that is what we have in the Bible and then we have to reinterpret the, the words of the Bible saying okay that is what God is probably saying or when we're led by the Spirit and we find the real meaning of certain things then we can say this is what God is saying so the Bible teaches the Bible says and I'm going uh, against certain 
teachers and certain preachers that say you can't say that anymore. I say it with confidence. The Bible says God speaks through the word and he speaks also through individual people. Where does one find God's thoughts? Where does one find God's thoughts? According to Christian theology and inherent to any Christian epistemology, Christian knowledge, we find God's portrayal of reality and means by which to understand things correctly in the inspired scriptures. We call them the holy scriptures. Holy scriptures means that the scriptures set apart not the same, I mean, you use the same words, but the, the, the meaning, the spirituality is different. Nobody understands unless you have the Holy Spirit. Um, do, we, do we find the God's interpretation of reality? Look at the interpretation of reality by God. Look at the, 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 the book of Genesis. Look at the first chapters. And you understand there is a reality that is above us. There's a reality that is, uh, is so mighty, so strong, so great, so big, so important. And who am I? Who are you? What is happening? Okay, is this to say that only those who believe the Bible and whose hearts and minds have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit really know anything? Of course not. <laughs> there are certain truths that are known to everyone. I will give you one, a very simple one. You, you, I mean, I, I, you, it is being taught to you um, when you're very young. Even in kindergarten, they will tell you one plus one is two. That's true. Is that the spiritual truth? Well, it has a spiritual consequence, but it's it's a natural truth. So people can know truth without having or, or or without having the spirit without being born again so we are not talking about truth in absolutes we are talking about the spiritual truth of the bible we are talking about the spiritual reality of us and uh, of, of you and me it has been maintained for instance that the impetus for the rise of signs in the western civilization own this or the frame to the framework provided by Christian theism. What it means is Christian theism has given a framework of thinking, and Western society, Western science is still using that same framework. So we are the forerunners of what we call science. So science is built upon Christian theism ideas. The creation is good. Creation is good and orderly and so able to be studied. And that is what a revelation of God and so the study of what it means or what it was a means of to being appreciated and glorify God. That is to say that science is also glorifying God. That's why, we remember, we, we talked about science before and we said, the better science, the better. The best science is the science of God. It, it does not that, that, that's not theology. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about science or scientists being led by the Spirit to find things. Not what the world is teaching, but what the 
Bible, what God is teaching in, in nature. The Apostle Paul is saying, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. For a second Corinthians 10 verse 5. All of humanity falls short to some extent of thinking and acting fully in accord with God's glory. Remember the text in Romans, we fall short on the glory of God. We just fall short because we do not do exactly what God wants us to do. Even as Christians, we sometimes miss the boat. We sometimes do something wrong. We call that uh, mistakes. But reality is those mistakes are sin. And so that's what we have to look for. Think about it for yourself. Okay, this, this is, this is my, uh, my limitation. Whereas the unregenerated mind, however, seeks to create works or worlds of meaning apart from God as Creator and Lord. The regenerated mind, the one, the person who is born again, should seek to understand on the basis of the meaning God has given to all things as found in the revelation itself, namely the Bible. So the Bible becomes the main issue, the main part of our spirituality. And that is the reason why the world is attacking the Bible so much. Because they do not want that. They hate the Bible. They don't like the Bible because the Bible is so clear. Because the Bible is the Word of God, the revelation of God. God speaking, God directly speaking to man, to you and me, to every scientist worldwide. When he opens the Bible, God is speaking to that person. Whether he's a scientist or not, God is still speaking to him. That is, that is the power of the Spirit. That is the power of the Bible. A Christian epistemology, Christian um, knowledge, seeks to conform all thoughts and deeds by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to the Word of God. You know, that's the combination of the two. The Spirit is the writer, the author of the Bible. So when we, you want to know more about God, read the Bible. You want to know more about uh, the Spirit? Read the Bible. Because God is revealing Himself through the Spirit in the Bible. So what do you have to do? Read it. We are to love God with all our hearts, soul and minds. That is, according to Jesus, the greatest command. So, what we have to do is, we have to do, we have to use the knowledge given, the epistemology given to us. There's a whole range of materials available and, 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 and we, we can use them, but we can, we can only use them to glorify God. If we glorify ourselves when we, when we become rich because we are a scientist, um, I don't think that's a good idea. That's the same thing with the theologians. That's the same thing with, with absolutely rich pastors. It is never meant to be that way. It's not because you have a, you have a good pen, you, have, you know how to write well, and, and, and books are selling. Well, if you, if you have, if you make more money than you need, the best thing to do is pass on that money to other people. Sure, you can buy a house. Sure, you can buy a car. Sure, you can uh, send, send your children to college. Why not? That, 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 there's nothing against that. But on top of that, so many people are so rich. They, they, we're talking about people who earn or have millions. I just learned that Ronaldo, the big football player, is going to earn $200 million dollars. In, in two and a half years. <laughs> He's making more money. 
is mo making more money in a day than I make in a year. So he doesn't need all the money. Can I go to him and say, you have to? No, no that's the thing God has to do. He is free to do so. The same thing goes with, with people who make a lot of money because of the selling of their books. Fine. But if you sell too many books or you, have, you sell more books and you get more money in than you need, give it to the poor. That's what the Bible is teaching. And then you will help. You will may even, you may even meet angels without knowing it. So we looked at the epistemology. We can still talk about a lot of things about that, you know, and we are not going to do that. You can you can read the material in your manual if you want to study that more. That's fine to me. Um, look, look, we have to we have to be sure about certain things. There are um, certain ways of looking at material available to each one of us. So we need to have a methodology. We need to to set things in order for ourselves and so we can choose. There are two main uh, main ways of looking at it. You can have the deductive presuppositional or you can have the inductive presuppositional. It's just about whether you deduct or whether you induct. Presuppositionalism contrasts with classical apologetics and with evidential apologetics. So that's what we looked at before. You know, the classical one, the evidential ones, and, and then you have uh, another way of looking at it, of looking at reality is do we use deduction? Do we use induction? And again, I, I would say uh, read the material, uh, the materials in uh, your manual, and then you will see. And if you don't understand, please contact me. We will we will look at it. Uh, just just in short, um, deductive presuppositionalism, according to Clark. That is, if some proposition is not actually revealed in Scripture or deductible from other propo propositions so revealed, it is unknowable by a human being. So that's deductible. And then you have inductive. Uh, remember, we talked about Ron Nash, that's Ron Nash describes himself as an inductive presuppositionalist to distance himself from others. Okay. Um, Van, Van Til, that is one he's reacting against, he says, uh, Van Til did not believe there was a correspondence between human thought and divine thought. Uh, Let me say it this way. God's thoughts are above our thoughts, according to the Bible. So, up there, God's thoughts, down here, our thoughts. Is God, is God with his thoughts influencing us? So, to change our thoughts, yes. So you see, there is a interaction between them. And that is what we call induction or inductive presuppositional. We are not going into, in, in, into a lot of detail here um, because th this, is, this is not what we, what we need to know. We need to understand the difference between what we do and how we do it. Do we use 
deduction or do we do do we use induction do we take the material that's available and then let it work on to me or do I go with presupposition and induct my ideas to the the things around me uh, both have their weaknesses and both have their strength so let's let's not be afraid of those words let us just do whatever 